I'm Cliff, this is Life with MS. Today, I've got some really cool cutting edge news, but before we get into that, today is Ginger Chew Day. This is not a paid promotion, but this is what I take to get rid of the nausea, which I think is coming from the Maven clad. And so I'm not gonna chew that while I'm on air here because it'll make too much noise, but these things work great. And also last night I had insane, 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 worst I've ever had. TMJ. Do you get that with your MS? Because I think it's a thing. I'm going to do an episode on that soon. I tried um, ibuprofen. I tried heat. I tried cold. I tried sleeping on it. I tried sleeping off of it. It was really bad. And the one thing that actually worked, and I can't believe this, I, I just, I came up with a little game where I would start at the beginning of the alphabet and I would name three oceanic creatures with the first letter going as far as I could go, and I made it to the letter P, and I came up with pilot whale, porpoise, and pseudopod, you know, snails, sea snails, pseudopods. All right, you like that, you like that? And by the time I made it to the end of that, I fell asleep, and then I woke up and about four or five hours later, and the pain was gone. So that was a fun little practice, and um, it really helped just kind of calm my mind and not let me get totally wrapped up with the MS symptoms as well as the TMJ because I was really overheating. I was way too hot. I guess that would be overheating. Um, everything was kind of buzzing and vibrating and I was just, I was just having a night and I was super nauseous. I'm still very, very nauseous, but I, that could be a combination of all kinds of things, including the Maven clad. But anyway, so that's the story. I wanted to share that with you. Maybe it'll help you out at some point or not. It just kind of like, I know I'll use it again because it seemed to have worked. All right, let's move on. Andrea made me another shirt. You might've seen this one before. Pumpkin spice and a cure would be nice. Just in time for the Halloween and fall holidays. So thank you, honey. Love it. Uh, we may have had that on this show before, but I, I, I love it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great shirt. Okay, quick update. Ectrums 2025 is happening right now. Um, actually, it's been happening over the last few days. There is some insane breaking news happening with multiple sclerosis and all the brightest nerd brains have gotten together in Barcelona, Spain to talk about how we are going to not only treat multiple sclerosis, but beat multiple sclerosis at its own game. And this year is pivotal. Like the things that have been happening in research and the outcomes are mind blowing. It's very different from what has been happening over the last like say 30 years. And I would say in layman patient terms, I would say probably the biggest things that have happened in the last 20 years are, are all the therapies that have been developed. But now something is changing and that's what this episode is about. So if you wanna learn about those things, stay tuned. We're gonna hop right into it here in a second. I just wanna thank all my subscribers, all the people that have ever liked all the videos, all the people that have ever commented because it keeps Andrew and I motivated. You know, it's not easy to make this content, but I love waking up and just thinking about what we're gonna talk about today. And when I say we, I mean you and I, because you guys leave wonderful comments and I love that. So thank you again, we couldn't do it without you. Now let's get into what we all signed up for, let's go. So cutting edge MS breakthroughs, what's next? What has been announced at Ectrums 2025 this year? If you're unfamiliar with Ectrums, it is the conference of conferences for multiple sclerosis. There's an Ectrums 2, which is the American version, much smaller. Ectrums started off with like 40 people and is now 40,000 people strong. And it's the European Commission on the Treatment of Multiple Sclerosis. All right, so let's back up for decades. Treating multiple sclerosis was all about treating the attacks the MS attacks. We have basically been playing defense. Blue 42, hut, hut, hike. I've always been a big offense guy, try to sneak past the defense, but we've been playing defense, but things are changing. There's this fundamental shift, this, this new era arriving, and it's not one that's focused on holding the line. Hold the line, gentlemen. All right, so how did we get here and what does this new era look like? You see, so for years, even as we got better at treating the disease, the people with the disease continued to get worse and we continue to get worse. And that has been one of the biggest challenges with MS. It's just like the nut we have not been able to crack. We tried, we just can't crack the nut. Okay, let's call it and get the rum. And you may have heard of this before, 
PIRA, and that is progression independent of relapse activity. And what that basically means is like we are still having like these smoldering symptoms that continue to get worse, but we're not technically having clinical relapses. It's probably best to think of it as the unseen enemy because it's the one thing we can't really track that well. And I'm certainly dealing with it every day. I continue to get worse with my symptoms, though I haven't had a relapse in quite some time that I know of that we can prove. But Pira is the damage happening on the inside, even though we look fine on the outside. And that's what this new era of research and discovery is all about. September 2025. Write that one down because this is the moment we can really see where things are turning for MS. And this wasn't just some small step forward. So this turning point is a wave of critical data that shows we are really starting to see a win against the silent symptoms of this disease. And you might be asking yourself, how are we doing it? Well, we have three critical pillars we're approaching. And they don't act independently. They're all very much interconnected. And the first one is treating the disease deep within the central nervous system. Number two is repairing the biological damage that has been done by the disease. And number three, one of my favorites, is using very precise tools to track our progress and lack of progress in these first two things. It is a whole new strategy, but let's break down the first one in here and see what that really entails. And that means halting progression, which means we have to go straight to the source. For once, we're finally able to breach that blood-brain barrier. We're no longer just dealing with inflammation in the bloodstream and how we manage that. Now we're going deep, deep, deep into the root of the issue. And that wasn't possible before. And of course, I'm talking about getting deep within the brain and the spinal cord of people living with multiple sclerosis. And if you're asking yourself, how do we get deep within the brain and the spine and treat multiple sclerosis with all its little smoldering symptoms? Well, there's a new class of drugs. You may have heard this thrown around, the BTK inhibitor. Now, there's been a lot of news about the BTK inhibitors recently, probably in the last three to five years, but the breaking stuff has been within the last two years. Some of the trials have failed, some of them have succeeded. We've seen a lot of wins and a couple of losses, but we gotta keep look positive and focus on these wins because they're really cool. So what at 30,000 feet is the BTK inhibitor doing? Well, it's crossing that blood-brain barrier, which I mentioned before has been very difficult to achieve and finding that inflammation and kind of turning down the volume on it a lot, if not completely. This is like groundbreaking stuff, people. So do you remember the study called Hercules that made headlines recently? Well, it was a study that was about BTK inhibitors and what it showed was a 31% reduction in long-term disability in multiple sclerosis. 31%, that is huge. So then you think about, well, 31%, what does that actually mean in study format? Let's, let's personify that, right, if that's the right term. Take 31% of what you lost and put it back in your life whether it be walking, seeing, feeling, touching, thinking, any of these things, if you took that 31% and stuck it back in your life, how would that affect your day-to-day? -day? That's what we're talking about here. That is a huge number if you look at it in that context. How I personally quantify it is, what if I had 31% more energy throughout the day? <gasps> How exciting would that be? And I would think that if you added 31% more capabilities to people that have lost 31% thanks to MS, I bet you would significantly increase the level of independence. And here's some more good news. This is not one magic bullet. Look at these things. Tolabrutinib, a 31% reduction. That's the BTK we just talked about. Fenibrutinib, a two-year phase two data shows near complete suppression. Near complete suppression, folks. That's bananas. And then there's Ocrevus, which is still making waves in primary progressive, and that is big news too. So clearly the evidence is starting to pile up and this is huge. But wait, there's more. These are all about halting damage, but what about repairing damage? And this is where the field has really gone bonkers as well. So you can see there are a lot of wins happening in this 2025 year. Let's jump into that pillar two where we talk about repairing myelin. Of course, that's the insulation around the nerve and that's the thing that MS likes to do. It goes in and it becomes this like deconstruction crew where it's like, oh, hey, there's some really cool insulation. Let's just rip that off the nerve and cause havoc. Thanks, MS, you're awesome that way. And what has to happen here is we've got to figure out a way to rebuild that insulation or that myelin insulation around the nerve and get that signal to reliably going to where it's supposed to be. What if I told you that there's a study out there, 
I'm not going to name it. Okay, I am. CCMR, and I'll link that in the description below that showed that taking a pill, and this sounds like science fiction, could help rebuild that myelination. And what the CCMR trial validated is that pharmacological repair is biologically achievable in humans. Take this, and you too will be remyelinated, mortal. <sighs> what? That means I could get some of my function back by just taking pills? Like, this absolutely sounds like make-believe. But it's happening. It is absolutely happening. And I'm not talking hypothetically, people. This study gave us actual concrete proof that we could use a pill to help people get remyelination, and that means abilities back. It would literally repair your system from within. Now think about that. We would go from being considered disabled to reabled. How cool would that be to have a hang tag for your car? We put it up on the mirror and it says, I'm reabled." Sounds like superhero type stuff. And just a quick highlight from the study, I'll summarize it for you very quickly and basically tell you how they discovered that it was working is they managed to gain 1.3 milliseconds in nerve transmission. And that may not sound like a lot, but that's huge. They measured the time it took a nerve signal to go from the eye to the brain. And what they noticed was a 1.3 millisecond reduction in time. And while that sounds like a tiny little bit of time, it is, but it is a massive leap forward in understanding this disease and how remyelination works. Speaking biologically, it's a monumental breakthrough. And most importantly, objectively, it is tangible, concrete evidence that this stuff is actually working and happening. And that brings us to tier number three, which is implementing digital strategies to get the data that we need to see the effects of the things we're developing. You and I, if you have MS, you probably have MS if you're watching this channel. I mean, we're used to going in and seeing our clinicians and getting a workup, right? Like they test our nerves and all that stuff. Okay, let's check a few things real quick. A very simple test, and that happens once or twice a year. But now the technology is outpacing our availability to see our neurologists, and we need something more readily available. We need something with us. We need a digital assistant. We need some type of wearable. We need daily things that we can interact with where we can track our trends and our progress or our not so much progress. And these things will compile very robust data sets that show real world trends and patterns. And that basically gives researchers and on a personal level, our doctors more precise information on how we're doing. It's the long-term picture of a patient's health. And that's what we need. And with only seeing our neurologist once or twice a year, that was impossible before. But these tools are being used now. Case in point, I wear a Fitbit. This doesn't tell me anything about my MS, but it tells me stuff about my general health. There are things coming out that'll be very tweaked for our MS and be very specific to our condition. And that's super exciting because now when someone says, but you look fine, you can hold up a spreadsheet and you can say, but I'm not. Okay, maybe that's a little extreme, but I would totally do that. And some of these tools are things like the Floodlight app where you can do sensitive walking tests in your own living room. And of course, like I just showed you, we've got wearable sensors that do everything from track how much exercise you get from walking, running, jogging, elliptical, whatever, bicycling, to how much sleep you get. Now, I will say, uh, while this does track my sleep, I can't sleep with it on. Do you have that issue? Like if you have a wearable, it's very distracting and it just wakes me up all the time. It doesn't do anything. It's very passive, but I just don't like anything on my wrist. Have you found a solution to that? Comment below if you did. And also included in that third tier are things like digital platforms that help with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, I haven't tried any of those myself. Have you? Comment below if you have. I don't know how that would work or not, but it is mentioned in a couple of key sources. All right, so let's look at those three pillars. We're halting, we're repairing, and we're tracking. That is not just a small improvement. These are huge improvements. And that means a complete transformation in what it's like to live with multiple sclerosis. So how does this new synergy work? Well, first you halt smoldering damage by using things like BTK inhibitors. Then you repair using agents to rebuild those nerve structures, and then you combine it all and track it with digital tools. And what you have is an incredible patient-focused feedback loop of success. All right, so if we don't remember anything else because of our cog fog from this video, let's sum this up and just take this home. The new goal is to actively pursue neuroprotection and rebuild and rehabilitate those neurological channels that have been damaged already. And that is to say, rebuilding function. It's fundamentally a massive shift to stability and recovery, which I am so excited about. 
And for the first time, we're starting to see we don't have only the tools to find and see the disease. We have the tools to rectify the damage that it has caused. This opens up a whole new horizon of hope. And let's think long term here. Ask yourself this question. If we can halt, repair, and track all this stuff, what does the future of long term stability look like in multiple sclerosis? Looks pretty damn promising if you ask me. I'm Cliff, this is Life with MS. I hope you found this helpful. Smash that like if you did. Hit that subscribe if you didn't. I'll see you next time and I'm out. I wonder what's out there for people living with MS. There's only one way to know.